Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this month's. Um, my name is Kirsty Joy. I'm a clinical senior lecturer. Um, the forum is a monthly um, forum bringing together um, researchers and students from across the site at Imperial to discuss um, some of the exciting research that we're doing that might have an impact on global health. This month's session um, is run jointly with the um, Institute for um, Child Health um, and the Vaccine. Um, which Chris and I um, work on respectively, um, and is going to be looking at the different aspects of vaccines throughout the, their life course. We've got an exciting set of speakers. Um, I have to remind you a few things, which I've written here. I haven't got my glasses, so I can't see. Um, so I have to remind you that we're going to be tweeting, and our Twitter handle is um, at Imperial IGHI. I can see John's already linking up to that. <laughs> Um, so please feel free to tweet. Um, the, just to remind the audience that we will be um, recording the event and for the speakers as well. So there is um, please speak into the microphone. And when it's time for questions, if I could ask you to raise your hand so that we can get you to a microphone. Um, and can I just remind everybody just to put your phones on silent um, during the session? Because it's something I always forget and I'm always the goes off. Um, so I've done mine. Um, and without any more ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who is Professor Joanne Lucas, who is a professor of Security Law, who's going to be talking to us about um, the group B streptococcal vaccine or lack thereof. Hey. I was, uh, yeah, I was going to do one. <laughs> Sorry, we pay. It's, uh, it's I have one track mind. <laughs> nice. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. So yeah, Sharani Striskandan um, on Group A strep and why we need a vaccine and actually why we don't have one. So it's a little bit of a conundrum that I'm speaking perhaps at a vaccine meeting because there isn't one at the moment. So for those of you that don't know, um, Group A strep is one of those infectious diseases that hasn't got a vaccine yet is kind of notorious. We all know about it because it causes group A strep tonsillitis that you can see here on the screen. And actually worldwide, it's responsible for 600,000 deaths per year minimum. That's just an estimate. And that's not because of all the sort of gruesome invasive diseases that, that we hear about in England, sort of flesh-eating disease, necrotizing fasciitis, purple sepsis, toxic shock syndrome, pneumonia. They account for about 100,000 deaths per annum globally and about... 2,000 cases in England alone and 400 deaths per year. But the non-invasive um, non problems such as throat infections, including scarlet fever and so skin and soft tissue infections, although irritating, tend not to kill people. However, they provide the global reservoir for all of the invasive diseases, but also the non-superative um, non um, immune sequelae of streptococcal disease, and that is, in particular, rheumatic uh, fever, uh, which affects the heart valves, and chronic rheumatic heart disease. And that alone accounts for at least half a million deaths per year, uh, and predominantly affecting low- and middle-income countries. Rheumatic fever did used to occur frequently in the UK, but the last uh, British Pediatric Surveillance Unit study found 12 cases in one year, I think, in 1991. So it's quite rare now in the UK, but still prevalent in low- and middle-income countries. And for those of you who, who read the news, actually, we're, we're also the, world, we're the world leaders in scarlet fever. We've got 19,000 cases of this per year in four-year-olds. So what are the possible vaccines for streptococcus pyogenes? This is my stylized gram-positive bacterium. The big problem is that, unlike many other extracellular bacteria, you can't vaccinate against the capsular polysaccharide because it's made of hyaluronic acid, and that's what we're made of. So that you cannot raise antibodies against the capsule. There are, of course, um, carbohydrates. The group A carbohydrate could be used, sorry, could be used as a vaccine. And a number of cell surface proteins um, have been targeted as um, potential vaccine candidates, as have a number of secreted um, proteins that are potential virulence factors, as opposed to opsonic targets. So there are a range of obstacles to vaccine development that we'll, we'll touch on in the next 15 minutes. 
Some of them are fundamental scientific problems that we don't know what to do uh, about uh, getting a vaccine. But others of them are uh, sort of more logistic to do with translating and funding uh, a vaccine into clinical use. And key points I want to make are that the, the main susceptible populations are in low and middle income countries. If you were going to develop a vaccine for group A strep today, you would not be developing it to prevent against scarlet fever in England or against invasive disease in England. You'd be doing it to prevent rheumatic heart disease worldwide. Um, but by doing that, you'd have to prevent streptococcal sore throat. And um, the long-term effect of that would be, in fact, to eradicate all streptococcal disease because it's an exclusively human pathogen. So what is known about immunity to group A strep? What's the evidence that you could ever become immune to it? What's, you know, is there any evidence? Well, just uh, based on kind of what we observe in, in, in the community, we all have group A strep sore throats as children. Grown-ups don't get group A strep tonsillitis in general. Obviously, people here may have done that recently, but they tend to be younger. And if you look at this, um, the data for scarlet fever in England, you will see that essentially it's a disease of four, four and five-year-olds. Uh, you do see some disease in, in the under 10s, but the pre predominant group are age four to five. And the susceptibility to scarlet fever just disappears as, as, you, as you get older, as a child. Your uh, susceptibility to streptococcal tonsillitis continues till you're about 18, however. Um, and similarly, can you uh, protect animals from uh, infection? If you vaccinate animals <coughs> against group A strep by immunizing with heat killed bacteria, and then challenge them with the same bacterium, same live bacterium in a nasopharyngeal challenge model, the answer is yes, you can protect them. So you can induce protective immunity in mammalian models. So it should be possible uh, to do this. So what, what, what do we require? I mean, this is a gram-positive bacterium, right? So it's not, it's, you, you're going to need to have complement but also antibody. And that's shown by these sort of neutrophil uptake assays where you can look at fluorescent bacteria being taken up by neutrophils. And what you find is you need both antibody, but definitely you need complement in order for these neutrophils to take up bacteria. So if that's all you need and children are immune, surely adults should all be completely immune. However, unfortunately, adults are very susceptible to invasive disease, which suggests that actually our immunity, although we might become immune to streptococcal sore throats, it's not particularly effective when it comes to systemic disease. And you can have a look at that in a, uh, using a similar sort of neutrophil uptake assay by looking at um, what happens when you use serum from a range of adults who should be healthy. These happen to be healthy pregnant women. And you look at that neutrophil uptake assay. If you use IVIG, which is pooled immunoglobulin from thousands of blood donors, you can see that you promote very good neutrophil uptake of group A strep. But actually, when you look at what happens when you use serum from different women, is that only about 5% of them have got immunity equivalent to IVIG. 5% have got no detectable immunity at all, and the rest have got some immunity. So actually, we aren't brilliant at having lots of readily available systemic circulating immunity. And certainly for, the, for invasive infection, one of the hypotheses is that group A strep is simply too virulent to become fully immune to. It's got too many things that destroy the innate an adaptive immune response. It's got things that repel neutrophils, such as spicep, which is a chemokine protease. It's got this capsule I told you about. It's got M protein that inhibits complement deposition. And it makes a bunch of uh, different enzymes that can cleave immunoglobulins, on top of which it also makes some profoundly bioactive T cell superantigens that can subvert the B cell immune response. So it's potentially problematic to make uh, uh, immunity against this organism because it is quite so virulent. Nonetheless, there is evidence from the population that children gradually do become immune. So what have they been the previous antigens uh, uh, looked at in the past? Well, people have been trying to do this for a long time. Back in the 1920s, uh, Fred Griffiths in England actually was vaccinating rabbits with group A strep and inducing immunity and immune sera against streptococci. And these were known as um, Griffith's serotypes. There were specific serotypes or sera that he was able to raise against specific bacteria. And we now know, looking back, that what he was raising antibodies to was probably the Pelis antigen or T antigens that actually was only discovered about 15 years ago by um, workers in Novartis. 
Probably the most studied antigen is the M protein, which is a coiled, coiled cell surface protein of the bacterium. And it's got a very hypervariable N terminal. And that is the basis for serotyping. However, there are over 100 different serotypes. So that's problematic when you're trying to vaccinate against an extracellular bacterium. And then there are a number of conserved cell surface proteins that are shared amongst all group A streptococci and highly conserved. And I choose these only because um, Spicet was discovered here at Imperial and it repels um, neutrophil recruitment. And C5A peptidase is also a C3A peptidase and that also repels neutrophil recruitment. But they're both enormous serine protease molecules stuck on the outside of the bacterium. So they represent very good and very accessible um, antigenic targets for antibody. So if you were going to vaccinate against M protein, which is, has always been the favoured target of investigators, as I said to you before, there is this coiled, coiled dimeric structure that it has. The hypervariable region is here at the N terminus. Remember, this is a bacterial molecule. The N terminus is on, on the outside. And this is the region against which people will vaccinate against. But because there are over 100 serotypes, conceivably one would need to vaccinate against all of the different types of serotype. The other problem arises in that the received wisdom is that M protein is essential for bacterial virulence. But we know from work here at Imperial that if you actually look at some of the bacteria we find in our animal models of invasive infection that have been taken from clinical isolates in disease, that there are variants lurking, sequence variants lurking in the clinical isolates that lack M protein. They have a single SNP that allows them to just lose cell surface M protein. And those isolates are virulent. They've killed women uh, in the purple sepsis outbreak. They are lethal in mice. They don't have M protein. And there was just one SNP between having M protein and not having M protein. It was a single stop codon. So it would be very easy for this bacterium to, to, to avoid or evade uh, immunity, not only because of the hypervariability of the M protein, but also because of the fact it doesn't actually always need M protein, contrary to popular belief. And there are a lot of dogmas about group A strep that genomics is disproving. So, for example, it was thought that it couldn't undergo recombination-related remodeling. But um, uh, staff at Imperial showed uh, only a few years ago that it was possible to, for group A strep to completely recombine its genome and adopt a totally different phenotypic um, outlook without any capsule at all and change its antigens simply uh, in, three, in sorry, three to six recombinational steps. So it is possible for this organism to change very rapidly, even if mutational rate, for example, is generally thought to be quite slow. So having kind of dissed, if you like, the idea of a single antigen approach, what about combination antigens? And that's been favoured by some pharmaceutical companies and uh, who have been doing large-scale screens, and you'll be familiar with the... Um, you know, reverse factionology approach, for example, looking at screening the entire bacterial genome, looking for proteins uh, that should be on the cell surface, and then synthesizing those recombinantly, uh, making antibodies to them all, using those antibodies to prove that those proteins really are on the bacterial cell surface, and then vaccinating a whole load of mice with those antigens to see which one might be protective in a challenge model. And it's been highly productive for, for teams at Novartis, now GSK, in terms of discovering new and novel antigens that people had not previously considered. And indeed, discovering panels of antigens that might be put together to make a combination vaccine. And this has been done for a number of bacteria, um, group B strep, group A strep, etc., etc. Um, one of the uh, approaches we chose to, to use, because we didn't have the... Um, the resources, if you like, to, to make 70, 80 recombinant proteins and test all of those individually in mouse models, was to adopt an approach of doing immunoproteomics. But rather than screening serum from convalescent patients, which are assumed to be immune, but actually for group A strep, we can't be sure that they're really immune, we decided to use pooled IVIG. Because as I've already shown you, pooled IVIG from thousands of donors does have protective effects in are neutrophil assays. So if you take human whole blood and you incubate it with group A strep, the really curious thing is that group A strep will multiply 100-fold in about three hours. No other gram-positive bacterium or gram-negative bacterium would do that. So it's got this kind of particular 
slightly scary ability to multiply in adult human whole blood. I think this assay was done with my blood. And you can see these different strain types all multiply up to 100-fold in some serotypes. But if you co-incubate IVIG at 5 milligrams per mil with these uh, uh, incubations, you can prevent multiplication of the bacteria. So knowing that IVIG is protective, uh, Mark Wiglinski, who was a PhD student at the time, decided to affinity purify those antibodies against group A strep, uh, basically using a column. Uh, and he affinity purified the antibodies that were uh, predominantly against anything on the group A strep cell wall without knowing what those cell wall proteins might be. And he called that enhanced e, or e IVIG. And he was able to show that this was particularly uh, 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 enhanced in terms of its ability to opsonize bacteria and promote uptake by neutrophils. He then um, tested that uh, enhanced IVIG in a mouse model of group A strep, and he was able to show that the enhanced IVIG had increased ability to reduce uh, uh, bacteria in both a draining lymph node, this is an intramuscular model of infection, and also in the blood. So it prevented systemic infection. So it had proven ability to be protective in both a sort of surrogate human model, a whole blood model, and the mouse. And he then used that enhanced IVIG on a column to then pour down a whole mixture of streptococcal cell wall uh, products, again, not knowing what those were, to see what bound. And then he eluted the bound protein. So it was a very simple kind of process, really, in order to identify what were the proteins that bound. And interestingly, the antigens or the proteins that he discovered were very similar to some of the proteins that had been previously proposed or shown to be protective, including C5A peptidase, found in, uh, and he, he screened using 20 different strains, uh, and also uh, Spicep, but also M protein. So the point is that this approach does work, and it could be adapted for other gram positive organisms as well. But it does provide a number of novel antigens, but also a number of other antigens which have been previously tried and shown to be of effect. But the problem is, we've all got our different vaccine candidates, and I've shown this diagram before to some people. You've got your older single vaccines derived from academics working mainly in the States, who've got a vested interest in their protein, uh, or, including ourselves, to be honest. They discovered it. It's going to be a great vaccine. You've got the sort of immunoproteomic approach that we've done, and then you've got commercial combination vaccines. And ideally, you'd think, well, surely the best vaccine would be some sort of combination of all of those. But if you want to develop a vaccine, you need pharma on board. And the problem is that pharma are only interested in this group. They will not touch anything that has been shown to be of benefit in the past. And it's a huge barrier to making the best possible vaccine, I think. But anyway, I guess if they're interested, that's a good thing. So I'm going to um, move rapidly on because we haven't got time to go through all this um, and talk about, apart from needing a good animal model, you also need to be able to do human studies and clinical studies. And the problem with rheumatic heart disease is that to have a vaccine against rheumatic fever, you can't possibly do a trial. And that is because children who get rheumatic fever develop rheumatic heart disease when they're about maybe 10 or 11. It could be several years after their first attack of rheumatic fever. You would be waiting years to show an effect. It's just not feasible. So probably the only way of doing a trial is to do a trial to prevent streptococcal sore throat. And in the low and middle income countries where this disease or rheumatic heart disease is prevalent, it's actually quite difficult to do those field studies. But certainly that would be the ideal setting, or a human challenge model, and colleagues in Australia are beginning to develop this. It has been done before in the States. We would be quite scared to do it, I think, in England, but um, obviously we have a local expert in human challenge models here in the audience who might be able to persuade you otherwise. The other thing I want to say is that funding is a problem. Rheumatic heart disease has not been considered to be a priority for charities and certainly not for commercial development. The problem is that although children are very much affected by group A strep, rheumatic heart disease affects children who are predominantly 10, 11, 12 years old. They are not under five, and we know that being under five carries with it a certain um, uh, benefit in terms of charity funding. It is a problem, however, for maternal health because a number of maternal mortalities might be prevented if one were to eradicate rheumatic heart disease. There is another major concern about triggering acute rheumatic fever using streptococcal components. And I want to just mention that. 
I'm going to skip the um, surrogate immunity assays. That is that back in 1969, one group did one study using a very crude preparation of what contains M protein. And they vaccinated children who were siblings of other children who had had rheumatic fever. And they were, their aim was to see whether they could reduce streptococcal infections. However, in the course of their study, three of those children developed acute rheumatic fever, and this was reported in JAMA. Therefore, people interpreted this as group A streptococcal components and potentially M protein will in fact do more harm than good. They will trigger rheumatic fever. And in 1917, the, uh, 79, the FDA excluded any group A streptococcal product from entering any sort of human vaccine development. And that ban was only lifted about um, uh, 12 years ago. So there was a hiatus in streptococcal vaccine development because of that ban, because of the fear that we will actually do more harm than good by vaccinating. So how does rheumatic fever happen? Well, basically the theory is that group A streps uh, are antigenic components uh, might trigger cross-reactive immunity. So, for example, the M protein, showed here, might promote antibodies uh, which cross-react somehow mysteriously with myosin in the cardiac tissue. However, myosin is in myocytes, and actually the dominant t target organ of rheumatic heart disease is the heart valve, uh, and we don't really see myocyte damage. Uh, another theory is that antibodies to the group A carbohydrate, which we didn't talk about very much, um, cross-react with the um, N-acetyl glucosamine moiety on the group A carbohydrate, and that will cross-react with laminin and heart valves. And these are all the results of single studies, often from single groups, who are highly, highly, um, you know, uh, highly regarded work. But the problem is that it's a very difficult disease to study. And children with acute disease are even more difficult to study. There are also antibodies that might bind uh, collagen 4, uh, and these cross-react with heart valves as well. So there's a wealth of literature suggesting how rheumatic fever might happen, and you can see why vaccinating with streptococcal components might be seen to be a hazard. I'm going to skip that bit about hyaluronan capsule and say to you that one of our theories is that the streptococcal capsule promotes lymphatic tropism and coupled with the production of superantigens may indeed promote cross-reactivity. One of the things we know is that group A streptococcus can hang about in lymph nodes and actually is viable in the extracellular form. So it is possible uh, that one of the reasons why group A strep promotes rheumatic fever and this really unusual form of autoimmunity following infection is because of the capsule and its ability to be lymphotropic. So my final thoughts are that extracellular bacteria are one of the biggest groups of bacterial killers worldwide um, and that combination antigens may be the way forwards. I think immunoproteomics is quite a useful approach um, but I'm not a vaccinologist and I'm not, I'm not a commercial vaccinologist at that. And it may be that because of the virulence, virulence of some of these organisms, we need to target virulence um, proteins as well as opsonic targets. The one pe piece of good news is that in three weeks' time there is in fact a WHO meeting here in London about bringing back to the discussion table a Group A strep vaccine. And we will see what happens there. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, if we could leave questions until the end for the panel. Um, so now I'd like to invite up um, Professor Robin Trafford at St Mary's um, to talk to us about um, HIV prophylactic. Well, good afternoon. Um, changing from bacteria now to, to viruses. Um, of course, uh, Sharani was saying, well, I'm standing here because there's not a vaccine. Well, there's not a vaccine for HIV. Um, but it's uh, clearly needed, as, as I want to point out. Many people have asked, actually, 
do we still need a vaccine against HIV based on the understanding that actually we're very good at treating HIV. If you're diagnosed today and you're diagnosed early in infection and you get right, you know, correct antiretroviral treatment, you can expect to live a normal lifespan. And those people who are on effective treatment actually are far less infectious, possibly not infectious, than people who are in uh, acute infection and not identified. And so in 2011, the economists suggested uh, that we might be seeing the end of AIDS. Well, clearly that's not the case. Um, we still see about 0.8% of the global population are infected. And there's, uh, although there's 18 million people on antiretroviral treatment, which is a fantastic achievement, um, given that most of these people are in the developing world, and when efforts first were rolled out to treat people in the developing world, many people in the developed world said you shouldn't do this, they won't adhere to medication, uh, anti uh, antibiotic resistance, antiviral resistance will go crazy, and that hasn't been the case. But we can't keep up with it because for every person who we get onto treatment, there's another person being infected, um, and we reckon that an, an additional 20 million people will be infected by 2031. And so currently, it's costing the, the world about $22 billion per year, to roll out treatment to the 18 million people that are receiving it. And by uh, 2031, it's going to be at least $35 billion. So the question is, can you continue to maintain that, that funding? If world attention goes somewhere else, it's going to potentially break down. And this, this final graph here really shows different scenarios in terms of the number <coughs> of annual infections that, that occur. If nothing happens, we reckon it's going to plateau uh, just above 1.5 million. If you introduce an effective vaccine, the dotted line in green, you can see it brings it down very well. If we really ramp up some of the uh, prevention technologies that exist and treatment, you can bring it down further, but you still again need uh, a vaccine to uh, bring it down to really low levels. So we need a vaccine, but it's still a, a relatively long way off. Um, and one of the reasons for needing a vaccine is unless you can stem this continual flow of infections, you're never going to be able to make treatment accessible to those who need it or everybody who needs it. Why is making an HIV vaccine so difficult? Um, to put it in context, the SARS virus, you probably remember the SARS virus is a scare, an epidemic. Within identifying the SARS virus, the first vaccine that was available was actually produced within, our, uh, within about two years. We're now 30 plus years into trying to make an HIV vaccine um, and still not there. It's much more complex because most vaccines uh, work on classical vaccinology and they mimic natural immunity to infection. If you get flu, not everybody dies from flu. A lot of people recover from flu and won't get reinfected and you can study that immune response and make a vaccine that recapitulates the immune response. In HIV, the problem is that essentially uh, infection is never cleared by the immune system from somebody who becomes infected. And if you become infected and raise an immune response, you're still susceptible to superinfection. That means a different HIV virus can still infect you, so you're not uh, immune to becoming infected with other, other HIV strains. So there is no model to follow in terms of immunity uh, in, in, a, in a general fashion. What do we know about the way HIV occurs? Well, if you look at it, uh, somebody who comes into acute infection, they become infected, you see first acute phase reacting proteins, proteins then an onset of a, a, a pretty much a cytokine storm fairly quickly, and then they start to develop antibodies. But these antibodies, by and large, have no neutralization function. So they're not doing anything that's benefiting the immune system, even though they're recognizing the virus. And the first part of the immune system that really gives some control are CD8 T cells that kill infected cells. Um, and it's not until really quite late in the disease that you start to see neutralizing antibodies. And by and large, the virus outpaces those neutralizing antibodies, rapidly escapes, and those antibodies are no longer of benefit to the individual. Now, you're probably aware that most licensed vaccines are licensed on the basis of antibody responses. So I'm not going to talk about the T-cell components today. There are some interesting stories on the T-cell component for HIV vaccines, but due to the limits of time, I'm going to talk about 
antibodies specifically. Now, one of the challenges with HIV is that it has very few envelope spikes. So in terms of a target to go after, there's not much of it. If you contrast that to influenza, influenza would have between three to 400 envelope spikes. Now, why is that important? If you have a bivalent antibody, it's predicted that two spikes are rarely close enough to get both uh, FAB regions to contact two individual virion spikes. So you're not getting that avidity of, of binding. So already there's a disadvantage there. The next disadvantage is, is that the envelopes protein of which we know fantastic structural detail now. This is really moves the field, but it is covered in glycans. So these colored bits are the glycans and shown in, uh, in a cartoon form, you can see their position here. Antibodies don't like binding to glycans with high affinity. And we know that the neutralizing antibodies that work have to penetrate between these glycans. And to do that, they need to be very somatically hypermutated. They're very unusual antibodies with little protrusions that can squeeze between these, these sugars. Very hard to elicit. Um, the other thing we know is that this envelope protein, although it looks nice in terms of structure here, falls apart very, very easily. It's very mobile. So uh, the, the part that you want to target antibodies to here, the closed uh, component of the envelope, is uh, probably only exposed for a short period of time. It falls apart, and these internal components that are exposed are immunodominant. So essentially, the immune system is chasing the wrong target. And then the other aspect is diversity. I mean, we talked about hundreds of strains of group A strep. Diversity for HIV is enormous. This shows the worldwide diversity of influenza in 1997. This is the HIV <coughs> diversity within a single individual. Same amount of diversity. This is looking at the diversity of HIV just in the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo in 1997. So it's a major issue in terms of coming up with something that would work against all circulating strains. The good news is that some individuals do make broadly neutralizing antibodies. So it typically takes about two years to occur, and uh, <coughs> about 1% of individuals who are infected make antibodies that can target 80, 90% of the viruses. So that gives us a kind of roadmap, but of course that's only 1% of individuals. A vaccine that worked for 1% of people wouldn't really be very uh, effective. Um, why is that a problem? Well, um, one of the reasons is that we know that the neutralizing epitopes, sorry, antibodies that arise do not bind the germline B cell. So the undifferentiated B cell that's encoded in your germline <coughs> needs to recognize the mature antigen is not triggered by the envelope structure. So we have to understand how to get around that. Um, a lot of the antibodies are autoreactive. Now, of course, HIV individuals They've got immune damage, so they may be able to raise autoreactive antibodies that would normally be depleted in somebody who's healthy and didn't have any damage. So again, this is another potential problem. A uh, lot of mutation required, um, and they have these weird uh, structures, which are quite unusual. We do know where many of these neutralizing epitopes arise. This is modeling some of the <coughs> broadly neutralizing antibodies, and so we know what we want to target. And if you look at those antibodies themselves, they are uh, increasing in terms of potency um, of coverage, coverage and potency. So one aspect that's come out of this research is people are now looking at using the antibodies themselves for prevention and for treatment. So this is kind of a potentially an early win from this type of approach. <coughs> However, although they arise in infected individuals, by the time they've arisen, in that individual, their virus has already escaped those antibodies. So then of no benefit to the person who makes them. What the hope is, is if you induce them in somebody who hadn't seen the virus, they'd be ahead of the game <coughs> and that they would be uh, protected. <clears throat> and we know that's the case from animal models. If you take a macaque and you passively infuse them with these antibodies, they can prevent uh, infection. So the game is to try and take what's, known, what's seen in, in humans, in HIV infection, and recapitulate this with a vaccine. Now, obviously, you don't want a vaccine that's only going to work in 1% of individuals and takes an immunization schedule of two years or greater to elicit that type of immune response. 
Well, one of the things that, that's required, oh, this slide has got corrupted somehow, um, is that you have to stabilise the envelope protein. And so a huge amount of structural and molecular biology is now going into different designs to take the envelope protein and make it so it's stable and it doesn't fall apart. And I'm going to give you a couple of quick examples. One example is uh, this mutation approach uh, by our collaborator, Rohir Saunders, um, in, uh, in Amsterdam, who has engineered mutations into a soluble version that essentially gives very reproducible trimers um, that have uh, this typical structure. So here is the starting point, old, old school trimers, and now you see they have these very nice structures. They, uh, under uh, cryo-EM and crystallography, look like the right thing, and they bind the right things. So we're taking some of those into clinical trials, hopefully by the end of this year. Another approach that we've been working on here at Imperial is to engineer these so that the envelope doesn't require cleavage. To be mature, the envelope is actually cleaved into two components that still stay associated. But um, we want to deliver this using some nucleic acid approaches that I'll touch on in the end. And so we've re-engineered it so that you don't require the cleavage. It takes on the mature formation. It's stabilised. Again, it gives the right kind of structures that you want. And it looks right under cryo-EM on its own or binding neutralising antibodies. Um, so this is another approach taking structural biology, using design to develop mature immunogens and then test them in humans. Um, and then because we're still worried about the fragility of these types of approaches, the third approach that we're taking into the clinic is to take these mature, well-structured immunogens, treat them with fixation so they're cross-linked and essentially they're, they're like rocks. So you'll put them in vivo um, and they won't fall apart. Um, they should be maintained for a long period of time to induce or give the best chance of inducing the right antibodies. Now that's the first concept that may work, but it may not give us the breadth. So to give breadth, we've been working with uh, Betty Cormer at the Las Al Los Alamos Center in, in the US to come up with a design to give us global diversity. So she has a computer algorithm that looks at diversity, puts together mosaics, but it's rather than just basing it on sequence diversity, it also takes into consideration structure. So these structures must exist biologically so you have the confirmation. And she has come up with a, a set of three immunogens that cover global diversity. Here's the global diversity of HIV. You can see the imaging sitting here, here, and here. And although you can see there's some things around here, this doesn't actually show the prevalence. These are the most prevalent uh, strains that are currently circulating. Um, again, we've engineered these to give the right kind of structure. Um, so a lot of molecular biology to make sure that they work. Um, and those are now being manufactured to go into the clinic probably next year. And then the third approach that we're trying to develop is to cherry pick individuals that make broadly neutralizing antibodies but quickly. So rather than having something that takes two years, um, a group in Spain that we've been working with, Pepe Alcami's group, has uh, identified a number of individuals that make broadly neutralizing antibodies in less than six months. Now, a six month immunization regime is still challenging, but it starts to be practical. So uh, working with him, we've identified a number of envelope sequences from those individuals and we've re-engineered those again to go into the clinic. So um, where are we in terms of HIV pipeline of these types of approaches? Well ahead of us are two major uh, clinical trials. The first is this trial um, being performed by NIH uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. It's a very large efficacy trial but it's looking at antibodies that are not neutralizing. It's based on the Thai trial, which is the only trial to have shown a glimmer of hope at working against HIV. It had 31.2% efficacy. They're hoping that they might uh, improve on that with additional boosts, but that's out there um, and in the field. And there's a second trial that Johnson & Johnson are also pushing forward, looking at non-neutralizing antibodies. Um, in terms of approaches to elicit broadly neutralizing antibodies, Slightly ahead of us are NIH with this uh, trimer called BG505. It's a very nice structural immunogen. Um, and behind them, we have three waves going into the clinic. Um, 
through our European consortium, but they will be actually evaluated here in London. Um, and we've managed to make eight trimers, probably at a fraction of the cost that the US made a single one. So there's some advantages in terms of being smaller, nimbler, and faster. Is that enough? I don't think so. I think this is going to teach us the rules about how to induce antibodies of a certain breadth, but it won't actually crack the issue of neutralizing antibodies. And one of the problems we face is that you can't actually reproduce the type of antibodies you want in animal models, because the germline repertoire, B cell repertoire, of a mouse, of a rabbit, or even macaques are not the same as humans. So these studies can only be performed in humans, and that's a major challenge if you're starting to say you want to explore a range of different immunogens in a series of clinical trials, and each recombinant protein might cost up to a million dollars. Um, and so we've been trying to close this gap and look for technology that will allow us to put things rapidly in humans, study the B-cell repertoire, which we can now do, um, and then look at that repertoire, the antibodies, to see what they're binding and re-inform uh, the design of the immunogens. And we really need a technology that's faster and less expensive than using the <coughs> prominent proteins. <clears throat> so our first approach is to say, well, can we use DNA-based vaccines? Anybody who knows DNA-based vaccines, they work really well in mice, fantastically, pretty well in rabbits, pretty well in macaques, less good in humans. <clears throat> to get them to work in humans, we need to use electroporation. This is where you inject the DNA and you use an electroporation device that gives a millisecond stimulation. It forces the DNA into the cells and it gives you a better immune response. When we started this project that we've just finished, nobody had seen 100% seroconversion. The short story here is that by combining intradermal with intramuscular electroporation, we could actually induce 100% seroconversion whether we gave electroporation to the intramuscular, the intradermal, or the combined. The combined was the best approach. So now we have the first evidence that you could use DNA for a series of immunogens, study the B-cell repertoire response, and use that to inform your final selection for a real-world vaccine. Now, we uh, are actually in the process of pulling out the B cells um, and doing that repertoire analysis. We should have that later in the year. Um, so far, the sequencing is looking quite good and looking quite similar to a protein-based immunogen. We still think this is a bit of a disadvantage because you need an electroporation device. And if you've had electroporation, maybe some people here have been in that trial, um, it is not without pain. Um, and so it's slightly clumsy, and so it's also forcing us to think about next generation technology. And so we've been working a lot at, at the discovery stage at looking at RNA-based vaccines. One approach for RNA-based vaccines is just to use RNA, put it in the cell, express immunogens. It's, you can do that, you don't get much bang for your buck. We're more interested in self-amplifying RNA based on uh, alpha virus uh, replicon system. You put your RNA into the cell, it self-amplifies, you get much more antigen. So we've been modeling this in uh, small animals, um, and this just really shows a dose response. We can get good um, immune response just by injecting formulated naked RNA. Um, HIV is more challenging than influenza shown here. But what this has driven us is to think about technology, and this has been evolving into a new grant that we've got which is on uh, vaccine manufacturing technology. Imperial now has a vaccine research manufacturing hub where we're pioneering RNA and other platforms to try and accelerate vaccine development and make them more accessible um, to uh, low and middle income countries. So I'll stop there, lots of people involved. Thank you for your attention. head of a vaccine um, research initiative and I just have to put up a quick slide for an event for next Wednesday. Um, um, which Chris, I think we're going to talk about very briefly before your talk, is that right? Yeah.
So, thank you very much, Kirsty. Um, just to advertise this before I start, um, clearly, I think, as you hear my talk, and having heard the previous two talks, there are going to be some, some themes which come out. And the themes are that we've been really good at making vaccines against some infections, some very important infections, but the remaining ones have particular issues which make it challenging to develop a, an effective vaccine. And these challenges are what inspired us to bring together this cross-faculty network for vaccine research, um, which is launching next Wednesday. Um, the launch event will be over at South Ken, and I encourage anybody who, uh, PIs and, and postdocs who are interested and who want to be actively involved in cross-faculty collaborative research in this space to register. Happy to talk about it uh, afterwards, if you like. So my talk is, is going to be about respiratory syncytial virus, and it's, as I said, going to be the third pathogen where we don't have a vaccine, and there are very major challenges to developing an effective vaccine. Um, and I think I'll pick up a lot of the points that, that Robin has just made about the difficulties involved. So uh, RSV is, is in probably by many people underestimated as a pathogen. It's obviously very well known amongst pediatricians and, and people who treat young children as a pediatric infection and is in fact the leading cause of respiratory infection in infants. Um, most recent estimates, these are uh, estimates from 2015, suggest that uh, there are approximately 33 million infections every year across the world in, in children under the age of five. And that can lead up to, uh, lead to, up to 150,000 deaths every year. Pretty much all of these occur in low and middle income countries and in uh, parts of the world where there is adequate intensive care support deaths in children are very unusual. What's been more recently recognised is how important RSV is in the adult population, and particularly the older adult population. And the epidemiological data for this um, is much less uh, developed, um, but it is now believed to be a major contributor to deaths in the elderly. Um, what little data we have, mainly focused on the US, um, has suggested that up to 10% of pneumonias are caused by RSV in this population, and there's uh, an up to 5% fatality rate. Um, and this is uh, equivalent to the, the burden of, of clinical burden of flu in this, in this age group. So obviously, uh, RSV is a, primarily a seasonal infection, so you can see from this, um, this diagram, this, each map is a month of the year, and you can see that uh, in the winter months, um, December to March, it's mainly a, a disease in the upper, in, in the northern hemisphere, um, and then uh, it reverses during the summer. But there is ongoing activity throughout the year, particularly in the tropics. So um, it is a, a, there are major issues across the world. So uh, a little bit about the RSV virus. Um, I mean, superficially, uh, I'm going, uh, you can compare it with flu, for example. It's also an, RS, uh, an RNA virus. Um, it causes res respiratory infections. But, and it also has two major surface glycoproteins, the G protein here and the F protein. But unlike flu, where the surface glycoproteins are uh, very highly variable and undergo mutation, which leads to escape from host immunity, in RSV, the F protein is very well conserved and is essential for the function of, and the infectivity of RSV. So uh, is relatively constrained in its um, antigenic variation. Despite that, people are symptomatically reinfected throughout their lives. And uh, certainly from in vitro data, we know that RSV is able to subvert host immunity in a variety of different ways. Um, both in terms of uh, diverting the antibody response, altering chemokine-induced inflammatory responses, and inhibiting type 1 interferons, and therefore the antiviral responses associated with that 
So uh, that has led to this problem with being able to induce the right sorts of immunity that might be protective in, in uh, sort of um, conceptually similar way to HIV. That we don't have a roadmap to what we what kind of host immune response we really need to induce protection. The other issue is that um, RSV has had a history of safety issues when developing vaccines, and particularly this uh, issue of vaccine enhanced disease, which I'll just mention briefly in a minute. So um, there have been some, some major uh, developments in the RSV field. So RSV has been recognized for many decades, 70 years or so. Um, and uh, we've been investigating uh, the possibility of making vaccines against RSV for pretty much all that time. Um, but until fairly recently, it had fallen into a lull. People were pretty disheartened by what, what could be done in this, in this particular infection. But with some uh, new evidence about the structure of F protein and also more understanding of the, the epidemi epidemiology and the global burden, it's really galvanized uh, RSV in vaccine development. So that this summary um, indicates all of the, the different potential candidates which are currently in development. And in fact, there are probably about 50, um, some of which have reached phase three clinical trials. Despite that, I think that the history of RSV vaccine development has been littered with failures, and, uh, and that is true even today. So uh, this is um, uh, a paper from back in the 60s um, describing the vaccine-enhanced disease that was caused by the first um, RSV vaccine trial, which was given to young children. And in those children who were given the vaccine, when they were later exposed to the virus naturally, they, de they developed more severe disease. Uh, a number of them died. And uh, it was later understood that the vaccine had induced some kind of dysregulated immunity, which made the disease even worse and didn't protect these children at all. At the other end of the, the uh, developmental years, um, Recently, several phase three trials have, have reported of RSV vaccines in elderly populations, all of which have shown zero efficacy. And these are large trials of 10,000 individuals or more, which have shown no effect of these vaccines. So I think there, there clearly are some major hurdles left uh, with RSV. And, and um, uh, the, the primary one to me is that we don't understand what protective immunity is in this infection. So you have uh, these recurrent symptomatic infections and no one is truly immune to RSV. Um, you have issues with the fact that your target populations are the very young and very old who have very different needs and who have different um, types of gaps in their, in their immunity either due to immaturity or immunosenescence. Um, and for all those reasons we just don't have any correlative protection which allow us to predict which people will become infected and which people will not. Um, I've talked about vaccine safety and finally I think particularly in the elderly population we have so little understanding of the epidemiology that the, even if a vaccine were to be, become available we would um, have a, a very difficult time understanding the cost effectiveness. So. Um, so my group really focuses on the, on the immunology of, of RSV infection and uh, a lot of the, the existing data has relied on studies of naturally infected individuals and animal models. And, and clearly these have had uh, been very informative but have had issues. So with observational studies of natural infection, um, there have been lots of difficulties in terms of identifying the right patients, taking the right samples, and being able to interpret your, your findings in the context of multiple confounders. And then in the animal models, although you can infect animals with RSV at very high doses, um, they really seldom get uh, the same kind of syndrome, and there may be uh, fundamental differences in, in their uh, immune responses, which mean that extrapolating is quite, to humans is quite difficult. So uh, in my group, we've, we've um, established respiratory viral challenge studies 
in humans to try and address some of these issues. And these have been around for a long time with a lot of different pathogens, as you can see. But they're still quite a niche area. And uh, we do these studies here at Imperial, the only other academic uh, site that do respiratory virus challenge studies is the NIH. Um, and there are a couple of contract research organizations which do them for um, antiviral and, and vaccine testing. And the particular advantages, I, I won't go through all of these, are obviously that these are in humans, that you have a lot of control over the, 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 the way that you do the study, um, and it makes the interpretation of the data a bit easier. But obviously they're complex, they're expensive, and there are um, some caveats when you want to start extrapolating these findings into the high-risk target, target populations. So this is a, a sort of um, typical experimental design that, that, we, um, that we use here. So uh, we obviously screen our participants very closely to make sure that they are completely well and unlikely to get severe disease. Um, we sample them prior to infection and we can take blood, we can take nasal samples of various kinds and we can also look down in the lower airway and take samples from there. This is one of our previous clinical research fellows inoculating a, a participant. After you infect them, they need to be quarantined for up to 10 days to prevent onward transmission to the community. But during that time, because they're a captive population, you can really intensively sample them and have very powerful longitudinal um, data from that. Uh, we can potentially bronch them, bronchoscope them again uh, during the acute infection, and then we follow them up for initially a, a month afterwards, and then we usually call them back for at six or 12 months to look at long-term protection. This is the Imperial Clinical Research Facility over at the Hammersmith site, which is uh, where we quarantine our, our participants, um, and it's all very sort of slick and comfortable now. So, um, when we first started these uh, types of studies with RSV, the only correlative protection known was serum neutralizing antibody. And serum neutralizing antibody, as I'll show you with our data, is actually a fairly poor correlative protection in this, in this infection. Um, it is known that if you have no serum antibodies, then you will have a, a high risk of infection. Um, which is true in, in young children and primary infections. And then when you reach an adult sort of level of, of serum neutralizing antibody, then you have a sort of adult level of susceptibility to, to disease and infection, which is obviously less than in young children. But apart from that, there's no, uh, there's no absolute threshold above which we know uh, the risk changes and uh, the, the closeness of that correlation is poor. So, um, to understand antibodies a little bit better in this, in this uh, infection, we recruited a, a number of people and we didn't pre-screen them for their serum neutralizing antibodies. So these people have a range of, of, of uh, antibody titers and we inoculated them with RSV. We found that um, just over half of them became infected um, and about two thirds of those became uh, symptomatic with that infection with a third remaining asymptomatic. So that heterogeneity in the outcome allows us to start pulling apart which aspects of, of pre-existing immunity and, um, and even the, the responses might be, resp might be involved in reducing the severity of disease. So this is what happens after infection. You get a fairly typical increase in the symptoms, which are mainly upper respiratory tract symptoms, peaking around day six, day seven. You have this... Um, incubation period where nothing seems to be happening for about three days. Uh, here, this is the viral load, and, and this little blip is probably just some of the inoculum, which you can still detect. But after that, the, uh, the viral load peaks and correlates very well with symptoms. And looking first at serum neutralizing antibody, you can see that although there is some kind of correlation, the confidence intervals are very wide, and there's huge overlap between the individuals who become infected and the, who, those who are resistant to infection, um, and really there's no significant difference in the overall antibody titers. So maybe that's not surprising because RSV is a, a respiratory infection. It's very much confined to the respiratory tract, particularly in mild disease. Um, and so we started looking at mucosal antibodies, and here you start to get an increase in separation between the people who are susceptible and to those who are resistant. 
So although there's still quite a lot of overlap in the overall, overall titus between the two, when you use logistic regression to model this, um, you start having more ability to predict whether or not these people will become infected based on their nasal antibody titers. So the problem with RSV antibodies following natural infection is that they don't last. And this, um, I think this is the most definitive evidence of antibodies being very short-lived in this infection in humans. Um, so within six months, the antibody titers have pretty much gone down to, to baseline levels, where, whether they're uh, serum or, or nasal mucosal. And part of that is related to a failure to induce um, the right sort of memory responses. So if you look for memory B cells against RSV and flu, after an infection, you get very good um, induction of uh, flu-specific uh, memory B cells both IgG producing and IgA, but against RSV, you get almost no uh, generation of IgA producing memory B cells. And that's been uh, repeated in, in multiple other studies and um, uh, in recent vaccine trials, has also, it's also been suggested that this isn't, a, isn't an easily reversible defect. So, um, we then started collaborating with uh, Biotech to have a look to specifically to try and um, improve local immunity using a vaccine. So this platform uses a bacterium-like particle, which is made out of Lactococcus lactis, inactivated. It's a TLR2-dependent um, adjuvant. And it's uh, bonded to the RSVF protein, which is stabilized in this conformation. And it's delivered by inflammatory <laughs> spray. And certainly in the preclinical studies, and in also uh, a proof of concept with a, a similar flu vaccine, it is supposed to be able to induce both systemic and mucosal antibodies. And we wondered whether this, um, by using a, an excellent vaccine, if, if this was indeed an excellent vaccine, whether we could retrain uh, the memory B cell response as well. So the first thing to, to say is that uh, the vaccine is immunogenic, but the responses were modest. So we tested this vaccine at two different dose levels, a low dose and a high dose. And you can see, first of all, that the serum antibody levels between individuals is very uh, widely spread. And after a low-dose vaccination, you get a significant rise in the, in the antibody titers, in the serum, um, which go all the, this was a prime boost, so you get a prime at day zero and a boost at day 28, and you get this rise, which continues up to day 120 before plateauing out. But the rises are very modest, the, the responses are modest. With the high dose, you get a much quicker response, um, but really it doesn't go any higher after the boost. So, the problem is that in adults, RSV is a ubiquitous infection and people will have been multiply infected mul uh, many times before in the past. And so they have high levels of pre-existing antigen-specific um, antibodies already. And to try and boost your immunity in the face of that um, seems to be a, a difficult, um, difficult ask. So what about in the nose? Well, um, in many ways, this was disappointing. So uh, this is a, an intranasal vaccine. You would hope that it would, it would induce um, intranasal antibodies. And if you look overall at the, at the uh, group as a whole, really, there's very little response. Um, but what you can see is if you uh, cluster these, um, that a proportion of these individuals, so the majority of these individuals who have the high dose group, in fact, about uh, over two thirds of them did have uh, a, a response, but they had responses at quite different times. So some people had responses after the prime, some people had them after the boost, and some people had them at, at the later time point. And obviously this is exploratory. These are small numbers of individuals. It's hard to uh, make very firm conclusions about this, but it does seem that um, there is a lot of uh, variability in the response and that you may be losing the, the uh, detection of that response by analyzing the whole group together. And one of the sort of 
issues about, um, about trying to induce, again, trying to induce antibody responses in the face of pre-existing antigen-specific antibodies is that if you have high levels of antibodies, um, then you are much less likely to get uh, significant fold changes in your um, antibody response from the vaccination. So that's, so that's pretty disappointing, really, and, and goes with the other vaccine trials which have, have reached the stage that um, trying to induce antibodies against, um, against RSV, especially in adults with pre-existing immunity, may well be a, a, a more difficult um, challenge than we had thought. So we started looking at other potential strategies for uh, improving host immunity, um, and particularly in the nose where you have first contact with the, with the virus and where protect, potentially the amount of virus is low and you might be able to, with a less robust response, still be able to prevent infection. So I'm going to nip the, through these very quickly for lack of time. Um, but essentially, we have been looking at the uh, upregulation and downregulation regulation of genes during the infection. And particularly, we've been focusing on this incubation period, because although it seems that nothing much is happening during this time, clinically, there are lots of genes which are differentially expressed uh, within three days of uh, infection, um, which are different whether you are susceptible to infection or resistant to infection. And some of these are uh, involved in, uh, we know are involved in host immunity, uh, for example, IL-17 and IL-8. And in particular, uh, looking at the, the types of genes which are um, differentially expressed, we have these genes which are primarily chemokines, which are associated with IL-17 um, production and signaling, as well as uh, humoral responses and some barrier functions um, particularly skin and, and uh, um, uh, keratinization. So I don't have time to show this, but uh, IL-17 is obviously uh, derived from a number of different cell types, um, T cells and innate lymphocytes, and we're, we're starting to look at some of those um, by, uh, by looking for those cells within the respiratory tract. And to conclude, I, I think the, the message, I think, is really that... Uh, Antibodies may be able to protect against some infections, and, and if you can, you can um, induce an extremely high level, you may well be able to um, protect. But probably that is not going to be true in RSV. I, uh, talking to um, industry colleagues, some people are, are still very optimistic about the ability of novel adjuvants to really push those antibody levels to a, a very high superphysiological level. But you know, I'm not that optimistic about that. Um, I think our data and other data are really suggesting that um, we need to start thinking about other strategies and that protection at the site of infection is multifactorial and being able to harness uh, cellular immunity and innate immunity may give better outcomes. Uh, those are my group and colleagues and, uh, and funders. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. So to our last speaker for today, Professor Nick Grassley, um, who's a professor of um, vaccine epidemiology here at St Mary's, who's going to be giving the last talk of the day. And you'll be pleased to know that I think there is a vaccine for your virus. There, there is, yeah. Um. Um, so thank you for persisting despite the heat. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, uh, infections for which there are actually vaccines, but they're vaccines which um, don't always work as well as we would like them to. Um, uh, so, um, and, and in particular, that challenge is one that we face in the, the low-income countries where um, these vaccines are most needed. Um, so I'm going to talk about... What, why oral vaccines are, are, are useful, what, what their benefits are, but then also what, what the underlying challenges with using them are. Okay, so one very obvious benefit with an oral vaccine is it's very easy to administer. This is a picture of a 16-year-old 
uh, vaccinating um, a child uh, in Afghanistan, in Herat. Um, uh, and vaccinators may often be quite young, and this 16-year-old this, um, vaccinated um, tens of uh, children on, on, on the, during a vaccination campaign. So these are very easy vaccines uh, to administer. So this is obviously an, a, a normal polio vaccine. Um, the other thing uh, which all vaccines do is induce a mucosal uh, immune response. So thank you, Chris, for introducing mucosal immunity. We, we didn't mention it for HIV or um, group A strep, but it's, th these are all, all, all have a mucosal site of entry, so it's clearly important. And I'm sure Robin could give us a, a, a different lecture on uh, mucosal immunity to HIV, but maybe we'll talk a little bit about um, how important it is to generate a local mucosal antibody response for, for those infections as well. Um, so oral vaccination induces um, uh, immunity in the, mainly in the small intestine, uh, also in the, uh, a little bit in the proximal large intestine, um, in uh, breast milk and in saliva to, to a lesser extent. So you do get a local antibody response. Um, and that antibody response is a function of, um, in the case of a live vaccine, replication of that live vaccine at, at the mucosal surface. So this is a, a slightly old figure, but a very nice one where infants who were immunized with the oral polio vaccine were sampled daily uh, to look for the presence of the, for the vaccine virus in their stool, um, and then for the presence of secretory antibody as well in stool. And so hopefully you can see on the uh, topmost uh, graph there um, that two of the three serotypes of the oral polio vaccine replicated in this particular child. Um, and after about a week, you start to see local antibody production against those two serotypes. For the one which did not replicate, um, you don't get a local antibody response. And so you would need further doses of this trivalent vaccine to in induce immunity against all three uh, serotypes. Um, once you have that local antibody, you're protected against reinfection. So the, the nice thing with having a live vaccine is that you can do challenge, attenuated challenge with that vaccine and it's entirely safe. Um, and uh, you can see here that, um, on this graph on the right here, that um, as once you've received one or two doses of oral vaccine, you'll, you'll, you have very good protection against becoming reinfected um, after challenge. So this is a, looking at uh, shedding of polyvirus after, after challenge with the live oral vaccine in children in, in India. Um, in addition to getting that local antibody uh, and immune response, um, uh, you would see a systemic response. So in the case of polio vaccine, um, if you see shedding, you typically see development of serum neutralizing antibodies. Uh, that's shown in this table here. So the majority um, of infants who shed polio virus will, uh, will seroconvert, not all of them. Um, and actually, interestingly, the, the, the more the virus is able to replicate, so the, 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 if your um, uh, live attenuated vaccine <coughs> strain is good at replicating, it seems to induce more uh, antibody in, in blood, which seems sort of obvious, but there's actually not very much data on that, at least for oral vaccines. So we see here that uh, um, those infants who develop a higher neutralized antibody type uh, um, have a higher level of um, uh, um, replication of that live vaccine. Um, for rotavirus, it's a little bit uh, less clear. Um, you do tend to see a, a higher antibody response um, uh, in infants who then shed the live uh, uh, rotavirus uh, vaccine. So in this case, this is data for Rotorix. Um, um, but the, the, um, the association is, is much uh, weaker. Um, and maybe something about the site of replication of rotavirus vaccine as opposed to um, polio vaccine, which really does replicate that uh, in your lymphoid uh, tissue uh, as opposed to your epithelial, uh, intestinal epithelial surface. Um, so obviously the advantage of having a, a, an easy-to-administer oral vaccine that induces local mucosal immunity that stops infection is that you can start to think about eradicating um, a disease. And uh, for polio, of course, that's a disease that's very close uh, to 
being eradicated, still some, some hiccups uh, along the way. Um, I haven't put a slide up for rotavirus, but that vaccine now also has been introduced, funded by uh, the Global Vaccine Alliance to um, uh, something like 90 odd countries and is uh, starting to have a big impact on uh, deaths and morbidity associated with severe rotavirus gastroenteritis. Um, so those are the sort of opportunities or the benefits of oral vaccination. Um, oh, and I wanted to say something about parental vaccination before going on to some of the challenges. Um, with a parenteral vaccine, so for polio we also have an inactivated vaccine that's in, uh, injected, it doesn't replicate, uh, but induces really good serum antibody response, um, shown on this graph on the left here. Um, this, this vaccine does not induce uh, local uh, antibody and it doesn't offer very good protection when in, in human challenge models. So this is a systematic review on the right here, just showing that um, comparing the odds of uh, looking at the odds of shedding challenge poliovirus uh, in uh, infants who have been immunized with IPV compared to unimmunized infants. Um, and you can see the odds ratio here is not different from, from one. So you don't see much of an impact of IPV on shedding of poliovirus um, after challenge. Uh, so this means this is an effective vaccine against polio as a disease, but it's not a very good vaccine against infection and transmission. Um, however, for children who've previously been exposed to live poliovirus, typically through vaccination, when you give a dose of the inactivated vaccine, you do see a boost in their mucosal uh, antibodies. So this uh, graph on the left here shows secretory IgA in, in saliva. Um, in children given a booster dose of IPV, and, uh, where they had previously either received uh, only IPV or they'd received OPV, and you can see in children who previously received OPV um, a, a boost in their secretory IgA in the saliva um, compared to those who only received the parenteral inactivated vaccine. So you can boost pre-existing sort of mucosally, uh, mu mucosal immunity. So these are children who have sort of been mucosally primed, as it were. Um, we did a study, um, uh, again, this is in India, um, looking at protection against challenge uh, in infants who'd previously been vaccinated with OPV, giving them a, a dose of the inactivated vaccine or an additional dose of the oral vaccine. And you can see here, this is for serotype 1 polio, a reduction in, in shedding um, following an additional dose of IPV uh, compared to no vaccine. And this uh, certainly did a lot better than uh, a further dose of oral vaccine, which had no discernible effect. Um, we were involved in a similar study with WHO, and again, a similar sort of result. This is trying to cap this, this sort of weird graph, which, um, uh, which I'm sort of slightly regretting making now, but um, shows um, the prevalence and the quantity of virus on the, on the y-axis here um, after challenge in those who didn't receive a vaccine and those who were boosted previously with a dose of IPV. Um, so these two studies uh, showed that actually where, where children who previously received OPV, a booster dose with the inactivated vaccine can be very um, effective at, at um, increasing um, uh, protection against infection. Um, this was um, uh, reported, this is about four years ago now in The Guardian, um, well, and other places. Um, and the nice thing is that this, this, this strategy of using IPV alongside OPV campaigns, uh, 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 sorry, in campaigns is now um, happening. And we're starting to see sort of uh, evidence of an impact of those campaigns where the reduction um, in cases and in detection of polyvirus in the environment um, seems to be slightly greater uh, for campaigns that used both the inactivated and oral vaccine compared to those that used only uh, oral vaccine. This is um, data from uh, Pakistan. Okay, so um, for rotavirus, um, uh, we have two li internationally licensed live oral vaccines. Um, we also have um, uh, uh, non-replicating vaccines in the developmental pipeline. This is data from a phase two study done by uh, Michelle Groom in South Africa. Uh, and what's interesting there is that with this parental non-replicating vaccine, uh, uh, they do see protection against challenge, where they've used here a sort of slightly novel 
concept of using the, ro the Rotorix uh, license vaccine as a, as a challenge. Um, and um, I guess there's an interesting question here about whether this parenteral vaccine is truly inducing local protection uh, in the gut or whether it's perhaps interacting with natural exposure to wild-type polyviruses. We know that these are a significant proportion, perhaps one in five, one in four of these children over the course of this uh, study would have been exposed to a, a, a natural infection with, with rotavirus. So I think that the jury is still out on how this um, inactivated or the subunit vaccine in this case is, is, is um, protecting locally uh, uh, in the intestine. Okay, so what are the challenges that we face with oral vaccines? I just wanted to highlight two. Um, the first is that these vaccines um, seem to be less or are less immunogenic and less effective when given to children in lower income settings. And that's common for all, all the oral vaccines that we, or live oral vaccines that we have um, available. I've shown data here for both oral rotavirus vaccine and for uh, oral polio vaccine. Um, this is a problem because, um, well, so for polio, we've ended up having to give very many doses of the vaccine uh, to try to induce an immune response in some settings. So, for example, at the time at which India eradicated polio, an average kid would have received 25 doses of the oral vaccine. Um, for, for rotavirus, I mentioned the, the, the good news that this vaccine has been rolled out in very many countries, it, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, where the burden has been uh, very high. Um, but the effectiveness of the vaccine there is around about 50%. So despite over 90% coverage with that vaccine, we're only seeing around about a 50% reduction in the burden of disease. And we'd really like that to be, uh, that reduction to be higher. Um, what might be causing uh, this problem? Well, I'm not going to go through each of these. Uh, uh, there are various factors that may be involved. We don't really know the answer at this point in time. Uh, this is taken from a nice uh, review that Ed in the audience there um, uh, led. Um, and here we're just trying to capture the evidence for these different factors that may be involved in the poor response to to oral vaccines in low-income settings. Um, uh, with, with the uh, red circles here highlighting studies that show an inhibitory effect, um, uh, grey showing no effect, and, and uh, green showing a beneficial effect. And you'll see that um, at, a, at, a, at a glance that there's really mixed evidence for many of these proposed mechanisms behind poor um, uh, immunogenicity and effectiveness of, of oral vaccines. Um, so just briefly to say what one thing that we do or are doing in our research group is to try and identify what correlates with the immunogenicity uh, of oral vaccines, focusing on polio and rotavirus uh, vaccines. Um, and um, um, I guess in brief, uh, certainly for poliovirus vaccine, uh, what we see is clear inhibition of um, the vaccine uh, uh, take and immunogenicity in infants who have a co-infection with another enteric virus. So on the left here you can see the prevalence of common enteric viruses uh, in children according to their zero response to immunization with OPV and you'll see that those that don't respond have a higher uh, prevalence of these uh, co-infecting enteric viruses. We also see in those same infants uh, a higher level of markers of systemic inflammation and also a higher level of um, uh, CD8 um, regulatory T cells um, or at least FOXP3 T cells homing to the gut, perhaps representing a, 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 a recent enteric uh, infection, possibly also playing a role in um, modifying the response to your, to your, to your um, vaccine. So I, won't, I don't really have time to go into the details, but this is ongoing work. The second challenge and last challenge I wanted to highlight was um, the fact that by using a live uh, attenuated virus, we risk that, that, that uh, as a vaccine, we risk that, that uh, th those attenuations are lost in the course of replication of that vaccine uh, in, in the vaccine. Um, this is some data from using next generation sequencing, uh, looking at um, diversity or entropy in uh, oral poliovirus vaccines. 
uh, after immunization. Um, and you can see um, a, a very rapid increase in the entropy over time in the first few days after immunization. Um, and you also see very rapid loss of um, the key attenuating mutations. This is for serotype 1, and you see similar patterns for the uh, other serotypes. So the virus very quickly adapts to replicating again in the human gut. Um, it, uh, um, having been kind of essentially cold adapted through the attenuation process that was pursued in the, in the 50s by, by Albert Sabin. Um, the, the challenge for polio eradication is that these, um, this, the loss of attenuation can lead to um, shedding of a vaccine-derived virus that can be transmitted, spread, and cause outbreaks of polio. Um, and that's uh, a major challenge. These are some of the locations where so-called circulating vaccine-derived polyviruses have been reported um, over the last couple of years. Um, and this is a real challenge, particularly for an eradication program. We do see some cases of gastroenteritis associated with vaccine-derived rotavirus vaccines as well, but it's a very uh, uh, um, small um, burden of disease compared to that that's prevented by those vaccines. But for an eradication program like we have for polio, this is a, this is a challenge. Um, what's the solution? Well, I, I won't spend too much time on this, but essentially uh, um, the global strategy currently is to stop using those oral vaccines. Um, so, for example, for serotype 2, um, the wild virus, ser last isolate of a serotype 2 wild virus was um, in 1999. So, in a sense, we don't need to keep immunizing against that serotype. Um, and so there was, two years ago, a global withdrawal from 150-odd countries using trivalent oral polio vaccine of the type 2 component, so a replacement of that trivalent with a bivalent vaccine. That means we're, we're entering a sort of brave new world where we have a sort of two-year cohort of children who have no or, uh, mucosal immunity to type 2 poliovirus. So this is a sort of very interesting time for the polio eradication program. And then finally, um, Perhaps surprisingly, um, there's still ongoing work, um, or in fact renewed interest, in developing new vaccines for polio. Um, and some of those are based on making better, um, more stable uh, attenuated strains that we can use safely. Um, okay, so with that, I'll finish and just acknowledge those people. Thank you. to use viruses that qualify to remove any of those. Yeah, I, it's it's clearly one of the one of the limitations of, of doing studies in human volunteers is that you can't um, you know there are limits in terms of using genetically modified challenge strains um, anything where there's a an increased risk of causing 
more severe disease is going to be a problem. I don't think it's completely out of the question. I just think that we haven't quite got there yet. I think, yeah, I mean, challenge studies with viruses have been, respiratory virus has been done for almost 100 years now, but uh, for a while they went completely out of fashion. And partly that was because of worries about safety. Um, obviously in the past they were done with essentially viruses which were grown up from people's phlegm and, and there was no sort of GMP or, or um, quality control of those viruses. And I think that now we're starting to accumulate a bit more experience. I think there is a, a potential for limited of viruses or, or conditions to, to try and address some of those questions. Yeah, so um, the viral load basically correlates with symptoms. So if you have a low, if you have few symptoms, then you have low viral load. But that it's it's always been very hard in in the setting of respiratory viruses to to really definitively prove that viral load is the cause of um, more severe symptoms. So the problem is that you're sampling from the nose. If you have lots of symptoms in the nose, you may well have um, you know, more permeable membranes, you know, there, there may be other reasons, then they're, they're not truly necessarily independent variables. Um, and then the other issue is that uh, these studies are relatively small numbers of people, um, just because of the complexities of doing it, and there aren't so many people who have that asymptomatic phenotype outcome that, uh, that we've been able to definitively um, look at what might be the differences between those people and the people who are symptomatic. Well, I think the the evidence from the literature over the last few decades is that. Um, there is no consistent um, protective immunity. Um, you may well have a relative, relative protection shortly after infection. Um, so from the, from, from the antibody curves you saw there, within a few months of infection, you, you probably have a boost in your antibody titers and probably your T cells and, and the rest, but um, those disappear quite quickly. And I didn't show you any of our flu data, but the Compared with flu, um, it, there's obviously a, a very significant defect in RSV. But yeah, there may be individuals who are super protected, but um, the, the difficulty with acute infections is that it's hard to identify who those people are um, in, in larger field studies. Um, so the way that the field is at the moment, uh, that basically we're starting with the most theoretically easy populations to, to vaccinate. So that would be pregnant women with the aim of inducing systemic antibody responses, which theoretically will cross the placenta and protect infants. Um, during the first six months of life, which would be the, the highest risk period. That hasn't been proved to be effective in RSV yet, 
but it has been with flu vaccines. Um, the next perceived as the, the next easiest population to, to vaccinate would be elderly adults, but already that's a very much higher bar to get over, um, as has been shown by the recent field trials. Um, there are very few mucosal vaccines um, being developed in, in um, RSV. So we, people have been working on live attenuated RSV vaccines for a long time, many decades, um, because uh, it's believed that giving a live virus is much less likely to cause vaccine-enhanced disease. So it, it would be the most suitable vaccine strategy for primary um, uh, inoculation of, of babies. But they have generally been quite poorly immunogenic, immunogenic and, um, and so the progress on those has been very slow. And then this is really the only other, uh, the, this is the, the vaccine that we trialed was the only um, inactive mucosal vaccine and, it, and I've shown it doesn't, you know, we've shown it doesn't work that well. Um, there are some uh, vaccines on the horizon with adenovirus vectors, for example, which can be delivered intranasally, but um, I think we're pretty early in, in investigating those as, as inducers of mucosal immunity. So I didn't have time to go into that, but yes, there are a couple of approaches. In the past, there have been three efficacy trials of T-cell-based vaccines for <coughs> HIV that have completely failed. And one of the re likely reasons for that is that they essentially didn't induce enough breadth in terms of recognizing a wide enough range of epitopes, um, and also the magnitude wasn't. Um, and so there are two approaches, actually, that we are looking at in, in our European consortium that are looking at it two different ways. One is to take uh, what we call elite controllers, individuals that are naturally controlling infection, um, and look at the epitopes that they recognize that are not recognized by progressing individuals, um, and take those and put them into an artificial construct um, and look at the immunogenicity of that. That's currently in a trial in HIV-positive individuals who tried an HIV-negative And the other approach that's being pioneered by Tom Hankey and Andrew McMichael in Oxford is to do this mosaic approach where, again, they look at conserved epitopes, put them together in a range of different vectors and see if that actually induces greater breadth. I think the problem with cell-mediated <coughs> immunity for HIV is that essentially it's kind of working, you know, trying to bolt the door once the horse is already bolted because you're trying to eliminate infected cells. And one of the major issues with HIV is that you get uh, a latent proviral reservoir um, and that's almost impossible to, to eliminate. So it may be that a T-cell-based <coughs> vaccine approach on its own is never going to work to prevent infection. It may be an important kind of backup to an antibody-based approach. It may have an important role in some of the approaches that are trying to cure HIV, um, but I think it will be unlikely to succeed on its own as a prophylactic. I think it's unlikely that they would be launched in the UK, but I think a lot of the economic analyses that are going on at the moment as part of the um, process of deciding whether or not there should be a go for a group A strep vaccine has centred around doing economic analyses in countries that have the ability to do those analyses, i.e. the UK and Australia, for example. And one of the biggest things we found is that the biggest economic burden of group A strep is cellulitis, actually. So it's a communal garden clinical condition, um, and it's very common. 
probably commoner than invasive disease, you know, severe invasive disease, but it's a huge burden economically. And most cellulitis is probably group A strep. It's difficult to quantify because we don't test. <coughs> uh, and that is probably going to be one of the things that swings it for pharma in terms of would you introduce a vaccine in, in somewhere like the UK. I mean, I have talked to people about the scarlet fever scourge. We're doing, um, we're, we're doing a very big survey at the moment on um, notifications of scarlet fever in, in London and gathering data that will inform an economic analysis of scarlet fever impact because it is significant, but it's mostly having, having an impact on, small, you know, on families rather than the health economy in general. Where? Here? Uh, in London. Oh, goodness me. Well, I'd be interested to hear all about it. Thank you. Um, okay, great. Um, other questions from the audience? Yes. Um, you, you mentioned that RSV and, and pneumonia in the elderly have uh, increased. They're vaccinated. secondary bacterial infection as, as flu, for example. Um, there's now a, a European consortium which has been set up, which is particularly interested in looking at prevalence and instance of, of RSV. So that will be also looking at Yes, that's, yeah. yeah, that's right. So um, you st you need the oral vaccine um, to induce a good mucosal antibody response. So you're responding to a host. Um, to prevent that. Um, now that we've withdrawn. Uh, one um, we do have a problem in that um, there are still some vaccine derived. process now where um, there has to be release of that vaccine by the WHO uh, Director General if they knew it's been infected by the area. Further vaccine derived type viruses are not. Um, the inactivated vaccine uh, probably does result in a degree of mucosal Um, the quantity of, of, of virus shedding when we challenge. So and, and there are theory that not that it does not. There are some you know, complexities about vaccine choice over the next Um, it, it, so, so there is a recommendation to introduce at least one dose of inactivated vaccine uh, globally. Available with the whole cell to trust it. Ask an HIV question. So for, for the for the so you have trimers that 
you, you hope will induce broadly neutralizing antigens. Some way of estimating portion of the global diversity of HIV those who um, I wanted to know how you sort of go around estimating that. And where the state always ha are you always going to have a problem? Always be a problem if individuals are not fully protected. Stop the infection chain, then you're not going to have replication. When we look at global coverage um, beyond Spain because you could say that these structures represent global diversity, but you could equally have a more engineered immunogen that induces an antibody that is broadly reactive. So you don't necessarily have to have breadth of immunogen if you can design an immunogen that induces a broadly neutralizing antibody. But in reality, uh, there's still an awful lot of research that needs to go on to understand how to train the immune system to pull out those very special Pretty much what we are putting into humans at the moment is to understand those pathways <coughs> that we don't actually anticipate, unless there was something magical, that those current images are going to give us exactly what we part of a, a, a process of, of understanding those pathways. So with broadly, <laughs> broad, broadly neutralizing anti-HIV antibodies, yeah. what about the functionality? So you know, the, the broadly neutralizing antibodies is obviously an artificial assay, uh, assay because it's an in vitro assay. But by and large, those antibodies bind with the fastest on rate and have the highest affinity <coughs> and are associated with a whole host of other mechanisms. So they are still very good at ABCC, antibody dependent ciliary cytotoxicity, antibiosis. So they have the whole panoply of other mechanisms. Now, there are some antibodies that can't neutralize, but also do some of those other functions but they're kind of lower grade antibody responses. So if you think of it as a spectrum, you're picking the ones that have the best functionality by the most assay. And if you do passive intrusion studies in uh, non-human primates, it's only the broadly neutralizing antibodies that give you sterilizing immunity. So all of the immunogens have been fully characterized in ter terms of their glycan profiles. So we know exactly what sugars are there, what types of sugars. Um, in the clinical trials, we will be looking for neutralizing antibody responses. We'll be pulling out responding B cells. If we see monoclonal antibody responses that have neutralizing activity, for sure we'll want to look and see if they have any glycan interaction. Thank you. Um, so, um, yeah, there's a consortium which is led out of NIBSC by Andy McAdam, um, uh, which uh, brings together these different uh, approaches to making an attenuated um, oral polio vaccine um, using those strategies that I highlighted on that, on that slide. And that's it's actually almost democratic because those are three different strategies from three groups across the world. Um, so there are currently two uh, 
uh, vaccine strains for serotype 2 uh, using different combinations of those strategies that have just completed um, phase 1 uh, testing in Belgium. Uh, and that's been done under containment. So uh, because modified polioviruses into the environment. So uh, they, they built a little housing unit um, and uh, did the trial there. Um, and I, I, I can't share the results from that um, uh, study yet, but um, that, that, that's where this, it's at phase one and it's uh, progressing rapidly with a lot of investment from Yeah. Um, so yes. Yeah, so you mentioned this problem that uh, which which I didn't cover, but with uh, uh, primary uh, individuals with a primary immunodeficiency, <coughs> T cell immunodeficiency, will uh, are at risk of prolonged shedding if they're given the oral uh, vaccine. Um, uh, actually, in in reality, that 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 shedding tends to be fairly short. There are just a few individuals who uh, shed for uh, more than say six months, and actually there's only one individual who is alive. And um, uh, so, um, we, so far there's no evidence of transmission from these immunodeficient shedders, so we don't actually know what the scale of the risk is, but of course there is planning around uh, managing the potential. Um, and probably the major thrust there is the development of antivirals. Um, and uh, um, again, th th those are... Um, Early in human uh, trials, there, there is does seem to be some, a problem with. Uh, if there are no more questions, can I ask you um, a final round of applause to our wonderful speakers? Thank you. Very much.